Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Micromaterialism Podcast. We have four co-hosts today because Ramsey is back in Utah and hopefully permanently going to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to be back in Utah. Of course, I'm Jared Duffy and I'm, as I said, joined by Ramsey, Andrew, and the one and only Dr. Sparks. We've got quite a crew here today and we are here to talk about a failure of Titanic proportions. We've been talking about failure with the last episode being the comet, and then a few before that, we had talked about the PG&E wildfires. Well, we're now talking about, of course, I think one of the most important and well-known uh, instances of failure, which is the Titanic sinking. So, before we get into some of the science behind it, let's get into a little bit of the background, even though most of you probably know the story, but... I, I realize I may be the only person who didn't know this story because I somehow never saw this movie when it came out, even though all my peers did. I, I don't think the movie is the most accurate portrayal of what's going <laughs> to happen here. Nevertheless, let me set the stage. It's early 1900s, so like 1907, starting to travel across the Atlantic is becoming important. We've got the Cunard Steamship Company. They build the famous ships Lusitania and Mauritania. If that sounds familiar, it probably ought to. Why do we know those names, Jared? Well, there's actually, before we even get into that, there's something kind of special about those ships because those ships are what they called four-channel ships, and there was three of them. So there's also the Aquitania. And so the thing about these ships is is they were relatively new, they were pretty fast, and the reason that they may sound familiar to you is specifically the Lusitania, because the Lusitania is one of the stories that kind of sets the stage for America's involvement in World War One, actually. Yeah, because this was a commer- like a yeah, residential commercial This was whatever. a commercial ship that, even though it wasn't an American ship, it was sunk by German U-boats, and it was part of the German U-boat's constant campaign to cripple supply lines. And it just happened that some of the times when they were sinking ships, they were hitting American merchant ships. And it started a, yeah. you know, obviously Pulled not so in. nice thing. Yeah. So these are, like you said, they're pretty fast. They yeah. weigh 30,000 tons, which is a big ship still. <laughs> fast comparatively, I suppose. Yeah. And they go 26 knots. So that is sort of like the coolest thing on the block at this time. And now you've got this other Irish shipbuilding company, Harland & Wolf. And they're thinking, what are we going to do to to compete with these ships? So they come up with the White Star Line, a name taken from, you know, the pennant that they have. Um, and they come up and they have this idea for ships that are fine. They're going to be a little bit slower, but they're going to be bigger and they are going to be luxury. When I say luxury, these things are so over the top. I mean, Andrew's going to talk a little bit about it, but I just one note that I saw is that they included some suites, which at the time cost four thousand three hundred some odd dollars, which in today's money would be like a one hundred thousand dollar ticket to go six days across for a one way ticket. Oh yeah, I mean, in the first class, each cabin was styled and decorated completely differently with luxury furniture. We're talking stained glass windows, wood paneling. This was the first uh, ships to have swimming pools on them. They had a full gymnasium with professional trainers. They had something called an electric camel, which is kind of like an exercise bike, but it has a saddle and it's kind of like a camel. Well, and then also there is, I think, what is probably the most iconic thing, and they've recreated it at some of the, I don't know if you guys have been to the Titanic museums that kind of travel around that have the piece, and that is the Grand Staircase, which, oops, yeah, tell me about right. this. What is this? The Grand Staircase, I mean, it's, it's what it sounds like. It's just a In massive... a ballroom or something? It's a ballroom with this huge, like, luxurious staircase, you know, all the crown molding, all that kind of things just going on. It's just a very pretty-looking staircase that I think because of the movie really started to pick up this second life as yeah. this very gorgeous thing. And so they make recreations of it sometimes. It's, so, it's very interesting to me. So it's pretty clear that the idea behind this White Star line of ships is just over-the-top decadence. So here we are. We've got they they built three ships, right? I don't know if it was three to compete with the the Lusitania, Martina, Aquitania, but they have the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic, right? So they're being built more or less contemporaneously, right? The Olympic's the first, and it's about six months ahead of the Titanic. So it's sailing, doing its thing, everything's fine. Now the Titanic gets built, and the Britannic is still being built when the Titanic gets done. This is so sad. The Titanic goes on its its maiden voyage. I mean, they do a quick like check. They they run it out to sea and everything's fine. But then its main voyage, it leaves on April 10th, right? And after only two days, two days, I'm told my wife's like, only two days? I saw that movie. It sounded like they were falling in love over weeks or longer, but two days, right? They fall in love, but this ship goes down. So let me tell you what happened the night that it goes down, right? They are out at sea, and they start getting radio calls uh, that there are icebergs in the path, right? Other ships are obviously in the same shipping route, and they're saying, heads up, we're seeing icebergs. In fact, they warn them, right? And and as far as 60 hours before the fatal crash, they're telling them, you should divert your course and go somewhere else. 
They don't do it, even though they were twice told to divert. Um, so they continue, and they're going at 20 knots, which is not terribly fast, but when it's something that big, it can't stop very quickly. And that's exactly the problem, is that they didn't have the technology we have today, and so this iceberg shows up. They've got about a minute to try and do something. So they try and, and this turns out to be a critical error, as we'll talk about a little bit later, they tried to turn as opposed to just hitting it smack on because it's probably about three times the mass of their boat. So they thought hitting it is a doomsday you know, thing. Yeah, they estimate about three hundred to 400,000 tons. Just unbelievably big. Um, so they try and turn. So they you know, hit the engines reverse. They're trying to turn this thing. And after 40 seconds, the ship is just barely starting to sort of move. And then they hit it. So they hit the iceberg. It's now, because they've turned, it's scraping along the side of the boat. Now, they don't know what damage has incurred just yet, but over the course of about three hours, this ship sinks. And obviously, the tragedy that involved you know, led to 1,500 lives being lost. So that's, that's setting the stage for the, one of the greatest materials failures of all times, but was it the materials at fault is, is the next question. Now, before we jump too far into the science, let me take it back a little bit and tell you kind of an interesting story. So to people who listened to the last episode, you may remember the story about the de Havilland Comet and how, weirdly enough, a previous employee at de Havilland had managed to write a story that essentially mirrored it in that they had this plane, it was new, it was all cool, and then it failed, and it failed because of stress causing a certain break relatively near, actually, where a lot of the issues for the real comet happened. So this story is actually kind of well-known. It was written in 1898, and it's called Futility or the Wreck of the Titan. It's just a story about a boat sinking. It's not a, you know, it's nothing too big at the time. What it is is Titan, it's a boat, it's unsinkable, it's really long, it's like normal stuff. But here's the thing. The length of the boat, within like 90 feet of the Titanic, it sinks the same month the Titanic sinks. It even gets down to the point where the speed at which the Titan and the Titanic crews are within like two knots of each other. They hit an iceberg, the boat sinks, they both have the same passenger capacity, they're carrying about the same number of passengers, literally every single detail of the ship, except for the date, just seems like a, a retelling of the story. If you didn't know this was in 1898, you would just think this is literally a ripoff. And it became this kind of thing where it was really weird, because unlike the last, unlike the story of the de Havilland, where it's just like, oh, whatever... People really ran with this. They thought he was a clairvoyant. They thought he was like a medium. And he was like, I just, I, I was a ship guy. I wrote a book because I knew ships. Yeah, so his story is like the Netflix adaption. Or sorry, the real Titanic is the, the Netflix <laughs> <Yeah>. adaption. <laughs> all right, so everybody wanted to know what happened to the Titanic because all these rich people died on it, right? So everybody's curious. A lot of money went down. I think it was like a 40,000 ton ship that went down. So... A lot of concern went into, was there flaws in the engineering design? Were the materials not sufficient? This was supposed to be just state of the art at the time in 1909 and 1911. So basically they studied the hull of the ship with sonar and found that a 1.1 meter squared gash was tiny compared to this huge hull, right? The outer surface of the ship. So at the time they were actually, they weren't sure if the ship broke into two or into if it just sank as one piece, right? So um, a gentleman by the name of Robert Ballard actually found the Titanic about 3,700 meters underwater. And the ship was actually broken into two pieces as he found it. And they were about 600 meters apart. Okay, so they studied the, the whole of the material and found that there was a ton of them missing from the ship and all the rivets were gone. So this kind of brought in another another question of was there a design flaw with the with the rivets and actually bringing it a little bit back so there's the whole ducto to brittle transition that occurs in materials right if you ever taken like a banana or any material stuck it in a freezer brought it out and just dropped it it shatters right so a lot of that also was in question was there a ductile to brittle transition or was this a uh, kind of design flaw and after finding these like huge pieces of the ship the, the outer layers which is called the hull they were all scattered around the ocean so it brought in the question was there a design flaw with even the rivets 
Andrew, you want to fill us in a little bit on some of those design flaws, maybe? Yeah, uh, I read this really great article in JOM. Uh, it's called The Royal Mail Ship Titanic. Did metallurgical failure cause a night to remember? And they uh, bring about kind of the prevailing notion and one that's still really popular. You know, this concept that you brought up, Ramsey, about the uh, ductile to brittle transition, right? Um, you know, we there's typically a, a marked transition point of when materials make this transition. And the idea for a really long time was that the steels that they were using on the outer hull uh, were well below their transition, so they were very ductile. So when they come into the impact with the iceberg, they're so ductile that they just fracture. They're not able to absorb any energy, and we get that that gas you were talking about. But like you said, it's what, like one square meter? And relative to the size of the ship, that's tiny. There's no way that that would be able to fully sink the ship. Yeah. Um, but still, a lot of research went into this, uh, as this was a prevailing notion for a while. So they took some of the metal, and they looked at what was in it. And one of the main things they found, the differences between maybe the steels we use today and the steels that they were using back then, is that theirs had a lot more sulfur content and a lot less manganese content. And the reason that is important is that that changes these sort of dopant concentrations of these elements, change where that transition between ductile and brittle fracture occurs. So for maybe a modern ASTM A36 steel, uh, your transition occurs around negative 27 degrees Celsius. Okay, The waters the Titanic were was going through were negative 2 degrees Celsius. That's freezing. Yep. The metals that were on the Titanic were rated. Their transition occurs at 32 degrees Celsius. So they're well below that, so it's definitely brittle. So that, that certainly probably did contribute to it. But then we bring up the fact that all of these whole plates had been ripped off. Um, and so that might be another significant issue. And so it kind of it kind of means that the whole plates being too brittle and causing that that gash to form in the side of it can't be the only reason here. Yeah, sounds like there was multiple design flaws. And that's where the rivets come in. And so NIST did a, a great study where they looked at a number of all of these these different rivets and looked at some of the material uh, aspects of it. And they found that the rivets that they were using contained excess amounts of slag, which makes them also quite brittle. So again, you know, all these forces, they're hitting an iceberg or acting on the rivets. They're very brittle. They're not going to be able to absorb a lot of energy. And so they break off the caps of them. And so then the panels also get removed. And that's how we can get uh, a hold in the ship that is actually substantial enough to sink it. It's pretty slick. The study by NIST, you can actually see where the slag's at in these rivets. It's amazing that they actually recovered these actual rivets from the ship, brought them up into a metallography you know, lab and tested it. I think this is so cool. Um, Imagine getting those specimens. Right. It's like, I need you to polish these, but and, we only have one. And they're kind of sacred. This is basically a grave, right, that you're recovering these from. So this was not taken lightly. Uh, very cool study, though. Uh, if you, by the way, are interested in the impact of slag on metallurgy, go back and listen to our very first episode on steel. We talked a lot about this because that was one of the major things. There was a lot of research into figuring out how to remove that. But that said, it's hard to really fault them. This was way back. This is in the early days of steel and iron, right? So they were doing essentially the best they could. And that was one of the takeaways from this JOM article. It's like the metals and, the, and what they had were, were not far from sort of the state of the art, and it, it probably wouldn't have saved them. And that said... Uh, there's another bit of evidence that suggests that it was the rivets. The sister ship, the Olympic, it collided into another boat, right? It had a it had a near miss where they sort of brushed sides of one another. And it also, there's dozens of rivets that popped off. They have a picture of it. You can see that they popped off in a very simple fashion. So it's likely that it was actually, ironically, get this, it was the fact that they tried to turn and miss the iceberg that's probably the reason why the ship went down. Because by turning it, now you have this brushing against the side of the boat, shearing off those rivets, the plates come off the boat, and we have this sinking of it. So I know that your intro to material science teacher probably told you the ductile brittle transition. That probably played a role, but not as much as faulty rivets. Honestly. Something kind of interesting, going back to what you're talking about, about um, recovering that piece of the ship, was actually kind of cool. Is if you go to any of the traveling museums that they have for it, like the big one, I think I went to one in the Luxor at the time I was there. They have a pretty significant chunk of the ship there. That's wild. That they just pulled out. And I know it's one of the only things that they've, like, permitted to be pulled up. And it was such a huge deal because of, first of all, like you said, it, it's, it's so deep. Almost 4,000 meters yeah. deep. That's like the Grand Teton, but upside down in the water. That's yeah, huge. And then, and then also the whole fact that, you know, when you have 
water and metal reacting yeah. for that long, you don't want to expose it to air because it's done for. Yeah. Well, this was a fascinating episode. Just to, I think it's kind of interesting to think of what happened to these other sister ships. So quick to, to wrap those up. The Olympic, right? The one that was finished six months before, it goes on to just keep on sailing, right? Despite what happened to the Titanic, it does something like 500 trips before it finally actually hits a ship. When it's actually coming into harbor, it hits the light ship and kills a bunch of people. And eventually it's decommissioned. But the other ship that was being built, the Britannic, right? It was being built as the Titanic hit. And so they freaked out. And so to prevent this from happening again, they put a double hole on the Britannic, which caused it longer to be built. It's not even done until right around the outbreak of World War One, And at that point, they don't need luxury liners crossing the ocean. They need the war effort. So it makes it becomes a hospital ship, which is rad. And it actually sinks by hitting a mine in the North Aegean Sea, which is tragic. Actually, the propeller actually pulled the lifeboat into it. Pretty grisly story there. But fascinating story about, again, once again, materials, unlikely as it may seem, led to a critical aspect of, you know, failure leading to disaster. Yeah, there's a lot that we can learn about materials by looking at the ways that they fail. And it's, it's a big part of material science job. Uh, we're definitely going to link those articles that we looked at um, because they provide a little more detail and some information uh, on the specifics of their studies and uh, on where some of these parts are coming from and how they compare to our modern metals. So definitely give those a read. That about does it for this episode. Before we go, we want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Thank you so much, Matt Match, and thank you, Elsevier. And big thanks to the folks that make the show possible. We have our musicians, Colabite and Alphabot. They make rad tunes. Check them out on Bandcamp, on Spotify. We like them a lot. And as always, we keep saying this, but reach out and send us suggestions for episodes. We love to get those emails. We love to get reviews. You know that. Tell us what you like about the show. What we can improve is also okay. But obviously, we'd love to have you here listening along. And if you want to connect with us on Instagram, we're happy to get suggestions and feedback there as well. It's at materialism.podcast. Have a good one, guys. Okay, till next time. Till the next disaster. <laughs> <laughs>